What's up, guys? Welcome again to Bio One Once. That word. Of all the pilots that we have discussed so far, they are the first group we will encounter that exhibits triploblasty, which means they have three tissue layers that are derived from the ecto, the meso, and the endoderm. However, they do not have a body cavity. The stuff inside is just really mush. What we call parenchyma. In addition to the fact that they are the first triploblastic group that we will be talking about, they are also the first group that exhibits by lateral symmetry. Aside from bilateral symmetry, they do have a nervous system. In fact, they already exhibit some degree of cephalization. Cephalization means that there is a concentration of these certain sensory organs at one particular end, which is the cephalad region or the head region. Many of them are simultaneous hermaphrodites. We do know what hermaphrodite means. You have a peen and a V. What if you and your you simultaneous hermaphrodite? When you do want to reproduce, you that know, nice time. You can just do it to yourself. They're kind of small, slow moving, very hard to find each other out in the world, and so they kind of just have to do it all by myself. They have what we call proto nephridia. Proto means like prototype first of its kind. Nephridia, nephro, nephron, that refers to the kidney. The proto nephridia, what they kind of have is these flame cells that kind of flicker like flame, that's why they got the name. And they kind of do the whole thing of excreting the waste out of the flatworm body. 80% actually of the members of this group are parasites. Yikes. Flatty, helminthes, it's in their name. They are flat worms, flat like these. Dorsal ventrally flattened. There are many different kinds of worms. There are round worms, there are cemented worms. But then these worms, why do they choose to be flat? Do you remember the answer to all of the world's problems? Surface area to volume ratio. We see it play out again for flat worms. If we look at the typical anatomy of your flat worm, we will notice that they do have a digestive system, although this is incomplete. We have the whole Nidarian thing going on again, mouth slash anus. Food particles. How did they know those were food particles? What if they were actually pieces of shit? They do have a reproductive system. We've mentioned that they kind of get it on on their own. They do have a nervous system and they do have an excretory system. So what are they missing? Respiratory, circulatory system. There's none of that <laughs> thing going on. That is where being flat comes in for them. You need the oxygen from the atmosphere and you need to expel the carbon dioxide, right? If you're flat and a lot of your body surface is exposed to the environment, well then all of these gases can just come in and out through diffusion. You don't need organs to facilitate that, you just let everything be flat. Being flat comes with disadvantages. You don't really need a bunch of other organs to just have all of these gases distribute throughout your body. However, the main drawback is that you cannot stay in relatively dry and hot environments. There's just so much of you that's exposed to the air, sunlight, heat, then... <sighs> Under Platy Helminthes, we have four main classes. Only the Turbellarians are free living. For monogenians, cestodons, and trematodians, these are parasitic species. What are you gonna find that they have in common? Suckers! It's just based on the position of the suckers and how they kind of look like in general. Why do they have suckers? Well, if you are a parasite, you need a host. You, as an organism, you cannot survive without your host you're going to have to find a way to hang on tight to that host. Once you get there, not gonna let go. Turbillarians have this structure called the rhabdites on their ventral surface. This is kind of like a dual gland thing and it secretes mucus so that the flatworm can sort of glide through the surface. What cestodons and trematodons have in common is that they have this indirect life cycle. That ultimately means they need an intermediate host. So there's the definitive host where they kind of reproduce and get things going. And then there's also an intermediate host which kind of just carries them around to make sure that they complete the next phase of their life cycle. To find the definitive host. But for monogenians, they kind of just do it all on their own. So it's like, yep, I'm gonna get out of here myself and then I'm gonna find the next host and then that's it. Wala nang middleman, di ba? Diretso na agad. Metamerism is the condition where the body has segments. How it functions is that each segment kind of works together to make the whole thing work. For pseudometamerism, anytime you hear pseudo, it means fake. And that's what cestodes have. You do have segments, but they kind of exist independently. They can do their own thing. They can split off and just, yup, I don't give a shit about you. They kind of look like these chiclet segments together. But if you take that one segment off, it can just survive on its own. For trematodes, we're particularly going to be discussing subclass Digenea. For them, they are also indirect parasites in that they do require intermediate hosts, just like cestodes. However, unlike cestodes, there is a particular stage in their life cycle where they will be actively looking for their next host. Whereas for cestodes, it's fairly passive. They just kind of plop down in a piece of shit and then hope that the next thing picks them up. It's relatively just a waiting game for cestodes. The representative we will be having for class Turbillaria is Dugisha. 
wetland area. It's flatworm ng bayan! These flatworms are very well studied in the fields of regenerative science. Kind of cut it in half and then see what happens. Oh, it's gonna grow back! In terms of the parts, they do have that pharynx that kind of sticks out and then it picks up the food and then it kind of gets distributed to the rest of the gastrovascular cavity. Take cross sections of your flatworm, you should be able to tell at what level you are based on what the gastrovascular cavity looks like. The representative we have for Glasmona genia is a specimen called Polystoma integerum, and this is a parasite of a neuron, a frog. What's unique about this species is that it has what we call a bladder stage. It's inside the bladder of your frog. And then there's also what we call the gill stage, where it's, it's stuck to the gills. Moving on to class Cestoda, we have three representatives in the laboratory. You have the fish tapeworm, the beef tapeworm, and pork tapeworm. Tainya actually means ribbon. Para madaling yung tandaan, di ba? Tain niya. Tain niya. Kasi nasa tain mo din naman makikita yun. The cestodon anatomy is fairly similar across many different species in that you have the scolex, which either has bothria, which are like folds, or you could have suckers. And then at times, it also has hooks, which can help differentiate among species. This rostellum is the structure that contains all of the hooks. May suckers na. Tapos may hooks pa. Super duper dikit. Talagang hindi ka na matatanggal. Pag nakashoot ka na dun sa host mo. Once you're in there, you've settled in. It's like, together forever. After the scolex, you have that region, which is the neck, and that's the actively dividing region, and that's the one that produces the long string of segments that collectively we call the strobula. When we say pseudometamerism, dito na natin nakikita yun sa strobula because each segment is what we call a proglotid, and it has nothing but gonads, really. It just has the male and the female gonad. Isn't that amazing? For cestodes, they've just completely done without their digestive system. They're like, nope, fuck that, don't need that. Why? Because the adult forms, they live inside the intestines of their host, so they have all the food right there. Nutrients everywhere. It's flooding. They don't need to digest it because the digestive system of the host did the digesting for them. So all they have to do is just let it diffuse through their tissues. And then they can concentrate on doing what they do best, which is total fuckfest baby making factory. <laughs> if the tapeworm is long enough, which means you've been taking care of it for quite a while, which that sucks. Why is there something hanging out of my butthole? You're scared and you pull it out and then makuputol siya. And so you think, oh, the worm is dead, it's gone. No, it's not. As long as the scolex with that neck, which will produce more proglotids, as long as that's inside your intestines, then you're fucked. It's gonna get longer. And the stuff that you pulled out, well, the tapeworm is gonna thank you because you just helped disperse it's bevis out into the world. Sometimes it's not the proglotids that come out. Again, it has the male and female parts, so it just has to fertilize that whole thing going on and then it can pass out the eggs. So you could be passing out eggs in your poop if some other animal just happens to pick that up, the whole cycle just repeats. So we have the beef tapeworm and the pork tapeworm. How do you differentiate the two when you're looking at them under the microscope? Head to the scolex. If it's got a rostellum, then you know it's a pork tapeworm. For a fish tapeworm, you just see that it has bothria instead of suckers. In terms of the proglotids, they just need to be different per species. But again, if you want to be really, really sure, you have a look at the scolex. Between beef tapeworm and pork tapeworm, however, which one is deadlier? Baboy. <laughs> yes, you could die from pork tapeworm. Sometimes, you can travel your brain, and it can form a cyst there. And that kind of sucks. And then you're gonna have some brain tumors, and then you're gonna die. Last but not least, let us discuss class Trematoda, particularly subclass Digenia, where many, actually, if not all, are parasites. <laughs> Di means to, Jenna means birth. They kind of are released into the world multiple times in different forms. One from the definitive host, another time from the intermediate host, and sometimes maybe another intermediate host. So this is where you'll see terms like Miracidium, Cercariae, Metacercariae, Sporocyst, Redia. These are just the different phases in the life cycle of your Digenia. You can go ahead and study the life cycles of your fluke or your blood fluke. They're fairly similar in that their first intermediate host is almost always a snail. And then from the snail, they kind of exit into the relatively free-living cercariae, which kind of swim around and look for the next host, which is sometimes an invertebrate, or it could also be like fish, who kind of stay there, and then they get passed out as metacercaria, which are kind of just like cysts, and then they get eaten by people again. Now, what's really interesting about this is one Miracidium clones itself into several sporocysts, and these sporocysts will also then clone themselves into several more sporocysts, or Redia, they turn into cercariae, and then metacercaria. So what happens is from one, you end up having like a shit ton of clones. Look at how complicated their life cycle is. Many of them are actually quite host-specific. They only really are able to thrive in certain species 
of gastropods are intermediate hosts, and that makes it even harder for them. That, you know, odds are stacked up against them. They have to get to the right intermediate host, and then the next intermediate host, and when they're in their free-swimming cercariate form, they can only really survive a couple of hours, maybe, with just one zygote that clones itself into multiple copies. It's like shotgunning the whole thing, and, and hopefully one of those babies happens to land into the right intermediate host, which then gets into its proper definitive host. That is a strategy that these guys have, you know, shotgun the shit out of the world because they have so many bases to cover. We have two representatives, however, there are actually quite a lot more. You might also hear of other parasites like Lenorchus, Opisthorchus, Paragonimus, but the ones that we will be looking at at least would be Fasciola and Schistosoma. The main difference, Schistosoma is not a hermaphrodite. The, the advantage of being a hermaphrodite is if you cannot find your partner, it's like you could do your own thing. You can make yourself happy. This is almost like, yup, let's take that challenge to a whole new level and just separate the male and the female. It's hard enough as it is that they're launching all of these random Miracidia with the sporses, with the intermediate hosts. You make it even harder with the fact that you split the male and the female. In the definitive host, you have to have the male meet the female. When they meet, they kind of embrace because the male kind of has that body fold that is specially designed for the female. Think of a hot dog sandwich. Male is the bun and female is the hot dog. And then they just fuck for the rest of their lives. That's it. They're just gonna be in your blood making babies for the rest of your lives and then you're gonna pass it out through your piss or your shit. And although we will not be discussing any of these in the laboratory, you don't really need to get to know them. However, I would also like to introduce marine life. Look at them. Just all the nice and striking colors. Why? Because they're kind of trying to imitate a relatively toxic type of invertebrate in the sea, which would be your nudibranch. Flatworms kind of have the benefit of warning other would-be predators that, hey, I am not tasty. I could be poisonous. You don't want to take your chance. In an ecosystem perspective, parasitism, it's one of those wonderful symbiotic relationships that helps control population. For the most part, parasites want their hosts alive for as long as possible. Because, hey, it's free food, it's free everything, and then they can just keep on fucking and making babies. Isn't that like a yahai best life ever kind of thing? Diba, binibigyan ka na ka libreng pagkain, tapos papatayin mo. Eh, pag namatay yung host mo, edi tegi ka rin, because that's like the end of you. You have no more nutrients, no more nothing. Now, if you are a host, konting parasite lang, oh, I'm so sick, I'm so weak. Or if you're immunocompromised, you may have another disease, and then there's a parasite that comes into your body and just makes things worse. Maybe you can't move around much. And if you're sluggish, you're slow because you don't have energy, you don't have nutrients. The parasite has sapped it out of your body. Wala ka ng panlaban sa infections or just predation in general. That means it's time for you to die. Hence, parasites are one of nature's cleanup crew. Do they eat shit? Do they eat decaying dead organic matter? No. Cleanup in the sense that parasites help weed out the individuals that no longer should be in the ecosystem. That's what nature does. From a medical perspective, however, we don't want them around. <laughs> That's why we go through all of these lengths to inform other people of what not to do, things to avoid, so that you don't get infected with these parasites. And if you do get infected, then here are a few things that you can do, some medicines that you can take to purge yourself of these parasites. In the ecosystem perspective, parasitism is nature's way of saying you have to die. Okay, natural selection does not favor your genes. But for medicine, it's like humans' way of saying, yep, we do not want natural selection to fuck with us. So we will find ways to make sure that these parasites will not get the best. Eat your flatworms. In the next leg, we're gonna look at roundworms. Bilug bilug, naman tayo. See you guys next time. Toodles.